Position available. Person needed to transform the system. Must be a visionary in thinking, a team player, able to inspire and willing to travel. Energetic in seeking challenges, she will be a rebel at heart, a free thinker, sense of humor an asset. Margaret Fulton has provoked, beguiled, and led the way to a fairer society. A breath of fresh air in our restrictive world, admired not because she climbed the pyramid of power, but because she has worked to transform it. the Holy Grail, the, the, the Knights in Shining Armor were reconstructed after the fact. But I think certainly with women's lives, I mean, oh, certainly my own life, uh, I did, it never occurred to me when I was growing up in Bertle, Manitoba, if I could get to be a little one-room school teacher, that was my ultimate ambition. Well, <laughs> the heroic <laughs> uh, tradition is not... Uh, one that I subscribe to. And in fact, in later life when I became a university professor, I had difficulties teaching that uh, concept. And I think one of the reasons why, um, to go back to a novel like Jane Eyre, which they criticize as a Gothic novel, the truth of the matter is, it's the story of a pilgrimage. It's the story of a person uh, who, you know, goes, goes through life and circumstances go one direction or another direction. Who knows? She became radicalized in that job. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing sight to behold. She has become more and more radical as her life has gone on. She, went, she left UBC to become the president of Mount St. Vincent's uh, University. She brought in a whole new idea of how to manage the place. Uh, along lines which, which make sense to women. She goes from strength to strength uh, in, in terms of her conviction and fervor, is much in demand uh, internationally as a keynote speaker on the concerns of women and how does all this work for women. Well, Fritjof, you said we needed to have some passion and that uh, this morning when you were raising our consciousness about why we should all be concerned about finding this new work, uh, you did uh, suggest that we needed to have the uh, anger of King Lear, the jealousy of Othello, and the love of Juliet. Well, give me a break, Fritjof. <laughs> The women involved were killed, and that would solve all the <laughs> That story that Brian, the environmentalist, was gone, who was so delighted to have his experience. Where is he? Is he still around? Uh, on the road to Damascus, well, Paul had that experience, and he didn't do a heck of a lot for women, I can tell. <laughs> I think we have to step back and realize that the job system you're talking about, which certainly needs changing, is a job system that started 10,000 years ago. It's been a blip in the whole history of the human race. We have to get money into the hands of people to free them up, to follow their calling, and trust the people to restructure society, to find the jobs, to build the community centers, to do whatever needs to be done. But as long as we're stuck with this patriarchal power system where all the money and all the power funnels to the top and little bits are dribbled out to us in projects, we'll never solve the problems that we're heading into. You said what was wrong with liberalism when you got close to saying, uh, that there was sentimentality in there. I was waiting for you to say, what, what's wrong with all of those systems? Whether it's liberalism or conservatism or Judaism or Buddhism or capitalism or communism, any of those isms all come from that same 10,000 year mentality of male power structures. And women are trying to fit into their structures and I think you're inviting us to join you in fitting into those systems and those structures. And I guess I, for one, say, call me. <laughs> I think we're going to do that. 
from what you know as a child, from what you grow up with, with, with as a child. So my, my circle was part of the family, part of the land, part of nature, uh, part of, of the learning, the schools. This was, you know, these were the things that mattered. Uh, and I guess I got that from my family. And, and I haven't deviated very much from that. My grandfather and my grandmother were, were real pioneer uh, people on the prairies. But Grandpa was just, uh, he was a reader, you know. He spent a lot of time thinking about uh, what life was all about. My grandmother, she had been a teacher. Uh, my mother had come out from England very much on her own, imbued with a lot of suffragette uh, concepts. So the role models that, that I had within the family home, and then of course it was the early days of, uh, of the Nellie McClung and women getting the vote, that was all still there in the air, although I, I, you know, I was born uh, in the 20s. But it was, uh, you know, there was a milieu, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that allowed women to be themselves, to express themselves, to have their own opinions, to grow up. And there was never a sense that you weren't equal uh, to the men. I think that that was a gradual growing consciousness that I could do things on my own. You know, your father could put you on the tractor out in the field and you knew what you had to do. I, I think that Again, it was the independence, and you had nobody to go to. You were the authority. Whether you knew it or not, it was your responsibility, and you had all those grades and all those kids, and, and you did it. You never quite know where that kind of integrity, that kind of sense of what Jane Eyre had, which was that wonderful line of hers, I care for myself. Uh, at what point uh, women understand that? Because the vast majority of women are socialized not to care for themselves. They're socialized to believe in the uh, fairy tale myths that um, some man will come along, um, you know, a knight on a white charger, all the old Hollywood stuff, and they will be carried off and live happy ever after. And, and, and what Bronte was determined to do in the 19th century writing was, to, was to, to demolish that myth. And she did not allow herself to be manipulated by any of those men in that novel. It was the halls of higher learning where Margaret first ran into the power of patriarchy. During the 50s and 60s, there were scarce, if none, women faculty at universities. It was here, at the University of Toronto, where Margaret was a PhD student in the mid-1960s. This encounter with Dean Woodhouse typifies then prevailing attitudes of an entrenched patriarchy. I never heard of such a thing, Mrs. Woodhouse. You'll write your thesis on Thomas Carlyle. Well, I had mentioned Jane Carlyle, well, an insignificant figure. She's not a major literary figure. Write it on Thomas Carlyle. I wasn't about to argue because at that point I wanted the ticket. I had learned, I think, some by trial and error that you better get the best qualifications before you start looking, eyeballing these guys. And then you can eyeball them and say, look, my qualifications are every bit as good as yours. Thank you very much. And I certainly knew when later I came back as Dean of Women at UBC that having that PhD and having uh, an associate professor status was as good as most of the guys I was dealing with and maybe better. And, and you see, it gives you, and that again is what Jane Eyre had, it gives you that sense of authority. You are your own authority. But you're not your own authority if you're trying to match yourself against somebody who, who has, uh, you know, every, all, holds all, all the cards and you don't hold any cards. And it's so hard for women to get out from under because women hold no cards at all in, 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 that, uh, in that metaphor. You have to get, you have to, to not only have the authority, but you have to have 
what is valued by man uh, professionally in order to, to be able to challenge. I almost didn't come to this last session on Sunday morning. Uh, Carol Matthews, I Dean of Human Services and Continuing uh, Education at Malaspina College in BC, is researching uh, alternate management models. Models of administration that sounded interesting. Uh, then I saw this woman who looked a bit like an old maiden aunt of mine, gray skirt, white blouse, and maybe a strand of pearls, looked very proper. And I thought, well, I wonder if we're going to hear anything new here. She called for a microphone in a rather authoritative voice, picked it up and said, does this thing work or not? And then said, uh, they're so phallic, aren't they? You know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And there was a kind of gasp in the room and everyone, everyone started to laugh and it took off from there. Margaret just started whipping through hierarchical models and showing how the church, the state, the education system and whatever was based on a kind of uh, male hierarchical model. Everybody neatly in a box. Don't try to read it. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, what it discouraged me was when the community colleges gave up being community colleges and all wanted to be universities with the same hierarchy, the same goals. And if we get into those systems, as I say, we find ourselves functioning the same way as the men because the institutions change us before we can actually change the institution. And what I want to stress with you is this, that inside all of our heads and inside our imaginations is that first pattern that I put up, the boxes. And nobody challenges to visualize any other way of doing it. <laughs> but stick with it and put one of those patterns on the wall of every employee and you will find the energy levels will come up and people will function differently. But then you see, we've got to get the institutions to start coming together. The <laughs> separating of all of our institutions is what is the means of keeping control on society. And to let go of those controls, people start to say, oh, it'll be chaotic. Maybe chaos is better. <laughs> It was, it was exciting. It sort of felt like some of the things started to fall into place and that maybe we were going down the wrong road thinking, how do we move up in the organization? That the real question was, how do we get a different sort of organization? In 1978, Margaret became the second woman to head a Canadian co-educational university. There was only one other woman, uh, a president at the time, that was Pauline Jewett. Two years later, Pauline Jewett resigned and went back to politics because she said it was easier in politics than it was fighting the hierarchy at the university. The minute you get to a position where you hold a title like president of a university, they can only perceive that as a person who is in a power position. I would, be, would have been very happy to have gotten rid of the title of president. And it's very hard, and it takes many women in those positions doing things differently before uh, they are perceived as doing things differently. You see, we've always thought, I've always thought, if we could get more women into political positions, uh, that then the structures would change. Well, I'm, I hate to have to say that I've seen more women changed by the structures than I have actually changed the structures. And, and, and so that tells me then that unless we step outside of the structures and work outside to, to bring some kind of constructive change, we aren't going to make changes. And I think that's what led me into the whole attempt to change the administration structure at Mount St. Vincent, then when I went on to Covina Universitetta. I think it again goes back to upbringing, uh, being raised in the 30s when we recognized that the power structure was not helpful to the farm community. My father was, was one of the founders of the pool elevators. Uh, of what was originally the CCF party 
And that again, all of the thinking for that came out of that social gospel, that, that you form communities and that you work together and you work together in teams and that you don't put up uh, these barriers. You try to create a society where the basis, in the simplest possible terms, is respect. But that's been, again, the structures of our society have made a virtue out of being confrontational. They've made a virtue out of being competitive. And, and, and both those things, uh, the, con being confrontational and being competitive, are what just lead to collisions. And uh, then, if you want to take it out into the larger society, I mean, so what do you end up with? You end up fighting a war. Frustrated with university hierarchies, it was here at Mount St. Vincent University, Halifax, Nova Scotia, where Margaret initiated her innovative circles. 20 years ahead of the time, she was the first university president to try an alternative structure of administration away from hierarchy and the pyramid of power. It was not unusual to see President Fulton strolling around campus engaged with students, staff, whoever. When I came here, there wasn't any. The person who was in charge of security was an ex-military man. On a woman's <laughs> campus, I said, come on, we women can take care of ourselves. So the circles came out of a very deliberate, conscious struggle to find alternatives to the hierarchical system. And so all the boxes, uh, as long as we continue boxing people off, classifying, labeling, we're never going to have uh, a group of people working together in an interactive way. You lose a whole lot of energy out in those boxes, you leave out uh, a whole group of people who could ma make a big contribution to the running of the institution or the running of the organization simply because they're so low on that hierarchy uh, that they're not consulted. I mean, there's a case in point, um, the cleaning staff at, uh, at Mount St. Vincent were tremendously helpful to me. Now, at no time was there ever a setup of meetings that involved the cleaning staff. So my idea was to get a um, totally different structure where you had everybody in groups that interacted. And so I started with that type of interaction at the Mount. We had these pods that flowed one into the other. We worked in that way. <laughs> In 1987, Margaret brought her circles to Norway and became advisor in the creation of the Women's University. We started with those and then we went back uh, and by looking at uh, nature and by looking at sales and trying to say, you know, what is the smallest unit and how, in fact, does nature organize herself? And, I mean, you, you just go back to the fact that there is a, a little miracle when a cell is uh, vitalized and starts in an organic way to grow and then it loops out and it mixes around and you know everything starts to come around again and it's as all of that interaction takes place that something emerges that is either a very beautiful flower or a very beautiful person and that's what we said let us get away from this totally artificial organization of society that goes back to believing that there were sky gods and leaders and boxes. Uh, finally, we emerged, and I don't know quite how it was that seven seemed to be always the number of circles that were the most viable, with the one interconnecting one that is the, is the blue circle. All the energy we know comes from motion. And it, what our society has been doing for 10,000 years is stopping the energy by setting up these rigid structures. It's as if you have to learn uh, everything that is fundamental in the structures that are there first, and then once you've learned them and you've achieved uh, a, a certain status, that, that you can then start to say, but we're going to find some alternatives, and if we have to go outside, and that's why I so admire uh, the Norwegian experiment with Queen Universität, because Barrett Oz was a professor in the traditional hierarchy at the University of Oslo, and she and her colleagues said, we're going to try something 
outside that's different and see if we can make it go. The invitation to spend a year with them, uh, I was very dubious at first because I spoke no Norwegian at all and just exactly what I could do, you know, I don't think anyone had a clear notion but somehow or other, because I had retired from the Mount, I had all this experience as an administrator, and um, let's, let's give it a shot. Ultimately, I think what, it, what I did do, I focused um, confidence in the institution to continue to do what they were doing and do it differently, because they were developing exactly the old uh, traditional university uh, uh, structures and the same programs, and we said no. Margaret is in Norway to celebrate the Women's University's 10th anniversary. It has succeeded, now funded by the Norwegian government because of its non-hierarchical administration. There is a second school in northern Norway and links to a similar experiment in South Africa. The school gives no degrees, courses for credit, and mixes learners from different levels. This is one of the uh, women we want to honor today. And not only today, but tomorrow. We are going to put a hat on her and we are going to give her a cape. We are very, very happy to have Margaret Hoku with us today. Will you please come up? And I feel that what really characterizes Margaret Houghton is that she is willing always to take responsibility. The most intelligent and committed scholars in peace research and conflict resolution, in theoretical physics, in educational associations, women's research and peace activism, are friends of Margaret Houghton. All over the world she is supporting women scholars, also from developing countries, the caring rationality which you are preaching, and the stand against violent, destructive acts. That's your soul. <laughs> That's the nicest introduction I ever, ever had. Margaret, thank you. It's a great pleasure to give you this uh, symbol of the goddess, the Scandinavian Nordic goddess Freya. Yep. And we the goddess Athena. Yeah, <laughs> both, both of them. We have the Greek now and the Norwegian both. <laughs> As Marge Piercy says in that wonderful novel, Woman on the Edge of Time, I want to do something important like fly into the past and make it come out right. Well, women are called now to do something very important, like heal the planet, bring peace to our hurting world. When you tell me what's wrong with the old value that we live respecting each other and all living creatures on the planet and their rights, to become fully developed, surely that is a sufficient value to take us into the next century. What is wrong with the value of love or of freedom? There are many role models to follow, women both of science and literature who stimulate our imaginations. In addition to the continuity that is in your life, and it's almost at a feeling level or at a, at a subconscious level, there, there is the sense of land. To what extent you consciously choose the landscape, or does it choose you? I'm never quite sure. And I think there was some great concern when I got to uh, Kavina Universitet, because it was so small, and it was so isolated at Doten, out in this agricultural uh, part of Norway. What Bert Az and her colleagues in Norway had, didn't realize that I was a rural farm girl. 
And I, I just felt as if I was totally at home. There were fields all around me. It was like uh, going back almost to my one-room school in Manitoba where I had students around me. Uh, it, it, it was a wonderful experience. If I don't get back to Burke uh, at least once or twice a year, you know, there's something missing in my life. Consciousness, and real consciousness about what you're doing and why you're doing it comes almost after the fact that there are coincidental things that happen and that you get led or pushed. Uh, and, and I think that uh, it was more, you know, that I, I, I drifted along. I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate in that I was always pretty good at my job, you know. Well, what was I doing? I was teaching health and physical education in Fort William Vocational School. Uh, when I, when I was, it didn't occur to me to look for another job when I was a one, when I was teaching one room rural school. But a couple of towns away, uh, they needed a grade seven and eight teacher. They had already heard that, oh, you, you get Peggy Fulton, um, she's, she's good. And, you know, the neighbors and the word of mouth and that sort of thing. So the next thing you know, somebody's offering you a little different job with a little more salary. And, and it just went like that. I, I can honestly say there were very few what I would call long-range goals in my life. Susan Simonson taught high school with Margaret in Northern Ontario during the 50s. They get together here at a friend's place on Salt Spring Island, BC, once a year. Margaret credits Susan and other women teachers for pushing her back to school to do her Bachelor of Arts. She was a mature student, age 34, and in her own words, stuck out like a sore thumb. Susan remembers Margaret as a dynamic teacher and coach whose teams won all the prizes. Put your ball down right there. There's a good dog. What a good dog. <laughs> said to Peg, if you get your feet out of that Manitoba mud, you're going to be lost. <laughs> I really do believe about Margaret that her upbringing on the prairie, in that wholesome, marvelous attitude, in that amazing family. Yeah, they were a team. They were a team. Uh, yeah. They and never come through the depression uh, with seven kids, if it hadn't been yes. uh, that they worked as a team. And it's not about polished sophistication and their basic values that has been her stability. I don't think in any way, we, you know, in your most sophisticated moment as Madam Chairman, that you ever really forgot it. And that was her salvation. And, and also her brothers who <laughs> kept her kicking the shins and, uh, and get her down to size pretty quickly. And blessings. <laughs> Well, the land certainly, I think, was the basis because that was the security. And when I opted not to go to the University of Toronto for my master's degree, uh, again, to what extent I was choosing a rural setting because uh, UBC, again, had Vista. It had the ocean all around at Burrard Inlet. Uh, you could knock off with your little brown bag lunch and run down to the beach and eat your lunch on the beach. It's a wonderful setting where you are surrounded by nature, or even although you are in a totally academic uh, setting. And when I left UBC to go to the Mount again, I was, I was not locked in to a big downtown concrete campus. I used to walk up around the mother house and way up through the woods. It was very re restorative for me, you know. Uh, getting out in nature is something that I have to do, that I, I, I am a part of it. And it's all well and good to talk about, uh, the, you know, the spiritual connection the universe. You've got to be grounded in the earth. And in going off to live in Salt Spring, uh, you know, westward look. The land is bright. Your attention, please. We are nearing Long Harbor on Salt Spring Island. A Vancouver and resident since 1987, Margaret has just moved to Salt Spring Island, acquiring her first mortgage. 
Turned down in the 1970s because she was a single woman, she is delighted that banks of the 90s now give mortgages to women. Life is a journey. It is moving on, you know. And, it, and I could have remained at Dauphin Collegiate all my life. I could have stayed at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. When I, when I left, there were people who said, go on to be a dean of women, destroyed her whole academic career. Well, did I destroy my career or did I create a different career? And, you know, as a Victorian scholar, I guess I said goodbye to Victorian scholarship. No more articles on, on Jane Eyre or Thomas Carlyle, but, <laughs> but uh, instead of that, you get writing articles on the university into the 21st century. Margaret remembers her days at University of Toronto's Whitney Hall, a girl's residence where she lived and supervised as some of her happiest ever. At home, in an atmosphere of camaraderie and equality, she nurtured a sense of community. Peggy's dinner table crackled with provocative ideas and literate dialogue. And for the mischievous Peg, it was the chance to pique a younger generation of women into challenging the system. The 60s were a time of protest. While Whitney girls marched on Hart House, the elegant men-only domain, Peg picketed the monastic brand new and all-male Massey College. The college now admits women and Margaret is here to visit Massey fellow Ursula Franklin, the first woman full professor of engineering at the University of Toronto. Peace and environmental colleagues, Ursula guided Margaret in the design of her alternative model. You and I have spent our lives trying to see that women are equipped to function in all situations, on all levels of life, in all levels of competence and responsibility. And very often, the very difficulty that women have to get into these structures makes them reluctant and sometimes emotionally unable to criticize the structures. It's a monoculture in which there's a great difficulty and danger that both the women's culture is obliterated and assimilated, but all other cultures too. These are market-driven, and these are really only considering as being valid those things that can be bought and sold, which is a fraction of all human activities. Well, it's only conformity that it values. Yeah. And the conformity that is valued is a conformity of mass production. Yes. Women are particularly hard hit because their culture is so essentially different yes. from production. Theirs is a culture that is, in a sense, built through nature in notions of growth and interdependence. It is a war of the global techno-culture of profit, whether it poisons people, whether it poisons seas, the atmosphere, the ecosystem. It's war. It's war against nature and it's war against people. Both at UBC and at the Mount, Margaret wanted to raise women's consciousness and create an integrated community of women, staff, students and faculty so they could become a force for change. She shook things up at UBC, effectively ending the engineer's Lady Godiva ride. Margaret's presidency from 1978 to 86 concentrated on transforming Mount St. Vincent into a modern co-educational university, but still focused on the needs of women. Curriculum at Mount St. Vincent was overhauled and new technologies introduced. She created a women's institute at the Mount while pursuing funding from the federal government for the creation of regional chairs in women's studies at universities across Canada. Her presidency came at a politically exciting time for women, with gains written into the Charter of Rights. And as the only woman university president at the time, she bravely brought issues of gender inequality to the table for discussion. Margaret's partner in capital fundraising was Ruth Goldblum chair of the Board of Governors at Mount St. Vincent. And, and we were the first two women to enter yes. boardrooms yes. Yes. looking for money for a women's university. university. No question. And they just sort of looked at us stunned, you yeah. know, why? We didn't have an engineering program, we didn't have a medical school, I mean, why would they give but money we to had, us? Yes, because we had the first, one of the reasons, yes. the first uh, English 
program in a Bachelor of Public Relations. We became very brave and we went on to Toronto and we had <laughs> corporate people that we're going to look at. And as we were in the waiting room and Margaret still was calling the shots of looking around <laughs> and in a stage wish, whisper said to me as we waited, well, Ruth, if they can afford to have this kind of thick pile in the carpet, they can certainly afford to give us a big donation. donation. And I said, Margaret, we have to be very careful. We can't look like we're too poor or whatever. And uh, it was on that occasion that we shared a room in a hotel. Oh, in you're not going to tell that in I have sacred precincts. I have to, I have I to tell I think we better that. get out of here. <laughs> And we got undressed, and I hadn't shared a room with Margaret before, and she came out of the bathroom, and she was in a pair of pajamas, I'll never forget. And I was undressing, and I had on a black slip that had lace at the top and lace at the bottom. And she turned to me in a typical Margaret stance, and she said, well, now I know why you're married and uh, I'm not. Oh, <laughs> don't you remember oh, that? Ruth. <laughs> So we made up our mind that we were going to give honorary degrees to outstanding Canadian women who did not already have degrees. And uh, Jean Sauvé was one of those women. And it was the first honorary degree that she received. So it was quite, and she was thrilled. It was quite interesting then when I showed up in Rideau Hall for the uh, Order of Canada ceremonies, she looked at me and she said, well, this is fair exchange, she said, uh, one honor for another honor. <laughs> and we had quite a little chat while she was pitting my, uh, my, my award on. She was always very gracious about the fact that uh, the mount was the first to recognize her. Margaret continues to mentor and take on new projects. As the one-member review panel for Kootenai District Arts and Post-Secondary Education, her recommendations for the Kootenai Learning Trust were significant and innovative. As Seniors Advisor to the province, she travels around BC to consult, then meets regularly with all ministries in an interactive pattern. She works at home surrounded by some of her honours. Officer of the Order of Canada, YWCA Woman of Distinction, 10 honorary doctorates, humanitarian awards, and her role models, Agnes McPhail, Canada's first woman member of parliament, and Emily Murphy, one of the Alberta Five who challenged the law to declare women legally persons. A new project is Persons Case 2. She works with Dr. Marguerite Ritchie in the National Council of Women to challenge our government. Why haven't we got 50% women in Senate? Margaret is in Geneva, Switzerland to talk about peace with the World Women's Summit Foundation, a humanitarian organization whose board she has just joined. She makes this a new focus of her retirement years, working to help the rural women of developing countries resist the pervasive and patriarchal monoculture. The foundation encourages activities that strengthen community, local culture, and environmental protection. It also works at keeping women away from the urban jobs culture. All of the United Nations efforts and all of the committed peace groups, the world in fact is a far more dangerous place today than it was in 1945. If we have any hope of creating a global peace culture, women the world over must not be naive about what is required of us. The kind of competitive struggles within racial, national, corporate, religious, or regional groups only play into those arms trade forces. European headquarters for the United Nations is also in Geneva. Margaret visits on its 50th anniversary certainly the only force that we've had for doing things differently uh, since the end of the Second World War. But it's gotten totally drawn into a very hierarchical structure. It's run really for the power structures that exist. Many of the UN organizations have ended up supporting uh, the structure of the organization and, and more money goes into that and goes into actually helping people wherever they are. Some people uh, in the UN are looking at those alternative structures, but 
where the money comes from, the governments that they're dealing with, they're also locked in to those old structures. It's not going to happen in a hurry. Sooner or later, that, that old power thing, which is using up so much of the world's resources all the time, producing what? Producing commodities that nobody needs. It's a, it's a system that's it's no longer viable. We won't solve all our problems until the female mind is developed and used on an equal basis and an equal balance with the male mind. The women's movement really uh, sparked two other great movements that have been the great movements of our time, the ecological movement and the peace movement. And that we mustn't, as women, we mustn't let small, small gains satisfy us. We've got to keep our eyes also on that larger gain of really restructuring and changing the way the male culture, the way they stand up. Somebody said, I think it was in uh, Merchant of Venice, wasn't it? Thus think because thou art virtuous, there will be no more cakes and ales. Well, <laughs> I'm not that virtuous. <laughs> uh, but I think if you don't have a sense of the spiritual dimension of life, you have really limited the potential of, of what living on this planet is all, all about. And. Uh, so I hate to see us destroying the planet, uh, but we are. And if we don't change our thinking, we may have to go through incredible eons of evolution of time before we ever have a chance to have the kind of consciousness that our species has developed today. And it seems such a waste not to be able to use that species for creative and positive things. Inspired by Rachel Carson's notion of the web of life, Margaret continues to seek patterns in nature or prehistory that offer alternative perspectives. The unusual tree of life window in Lincoln Cathedral, England is one such source. As you look at this window, you see that very intricate pattern of nature being superimposed what comes out of, the, uh, of this wonderful window is the tree of life, the different uh, perspective to the traditional. You look around here, this tremendous leafy foliage. Yeah. There's a basic theme of regeneration, which is inspiring uh, for women today. And that's why that we have this resurgence of interest in Hildegard of Bingham and earlier abbesses, because women had a long tradition there that just got lost at the time of the Reformation and later periods. Now it's coming back, and it's very exciting. The thing that was omitted for about, um, well, close to 1,500 years of history was the spirit in, in terms of woman's spirit. The early church period had been very unkind to women, but even worse than that was the scientific industrial world because go back to Francis Bacon and his comment that, you know, nature was there to penetrate all the corners and it was there to analyze and to cut up and to demystify. So feminists have, I think, been attracted to the notion of getting the mystery back into life and certainly Stonehenge is a place and, and again, they're not entirely certain to what extent it was Druids uh, here, but if there were, there were certainly Druid high priestesses. Now, while the pillars all seem to be pointing skyward in the very traditional sort of spires of churches, uh, there's something else that's, that if you look closely, everything is drawn around into a circle, and there is connection from one stone to the other stone. So I, I find that for all of, of the pillars, it's nevertheless very female in its symbolism. And so what you have is a kind of sense of woman spirit rising.
A believer in the journey, not the goal, and the importance of coincidence in our lives, Margaret has looped to the West Coast three times to do her master's degree at UBC in 1960, be its dean of women from 1974 to 78, and finally to retire. But the journey continues, taking Margaret and her circles to the world at large. It's not a straight road. You start at point A and you just keep going towards the goal. It was never a straight line. I mean, it seemed to me that that in, in your life, you loop out and you loop back certain focal points. And I think what brings you back to those focal points, friends and connections and, and, and a network. Yeah, yeah, now I'm okay. I'm oh, you are very much okay. You're elegant. elegant. President David Strangway of UBC has known Margaret since the 1980s. She knew many, many people here, and many very close colleagues and friends. So when the idea came up that we should give her a cross-appointment appointment as an adjunct professor, uh, I know she was thrilled about it, but we were thrilled about it too because uh, it gave her a chance to be deeply immersed in the things that go on around the university. She was there for lectures, dialogue, and uh, she never hesitated to come into my office and give me advice uh, on whatever the topic was that needed to be uh, that needed to be discussed. I mean, will be Dr. Margaret Fulton, Dr. Patricia Fulton. Carol Matthews has been researching the Norwegian Women's University. She is but one of an international community of men and women that Margaret has mentored. I think a lot of women consider Margaret a mentor. I know so many women who called her and said they'd like some information about something, and she says, well, why don't you just come on over? Come over and we'll have some lunch and talk about that. And she's absolutely generous with her time and information and um, just makes herself available to people in all sorts of ways. If life is to be more than just survival, and I think to have meaning, you've got to do more than just survive. Life is more than being entertained. So uh, where does the richness come from? It comes from giving service, and it comes from uh, interaction with other people and relationships. And I think it's, it's, it's relationships and serving Thank you. You were the one place where I experienced enthusiasm and passion today. No, no, the other. Margaret, you did not see us. You see that you're still out hammering. And somehow or other, stimulation. I mean, nothing. We know a child won't even grow if there's no stimulation. You've got to have that uh, that stimulation coming in so that you get some growth. And learning is is the greatest stimulation there is. To, to go on pushing back the boundaries of your mind, pushing against your limitations. So your circle is always expanding. And uh, what helps with the expanding of your own circle is the loops that you make with all of the other circles that are moving around you. They made her a goddess at this ceremony here yesterday. And uh, the goddess Freya, I believe, runs all over the globe uh, uh, whipping up trouble of various sorts, so I expect Margaret to do that. I now have two wonderful goddess medals. This one was given to me in 1981 by three universities in Canada. Uh, it's called the um, Goddess Athena, it's the Goddess of Wisdom, and it commemorates when uh, Canadian women first were admitted into Canadian universities in, in uh, 1881. When I received it, I said I thought it was unusual that I was chosen by these three universities. I may say that Northrop Frye, who was at the head table at the time, was not amused when I pointed out that I was, while I was pleased to have the medal, I would have liked a job better. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's life. There's a wonderful line in Tennyson, good old Ulysses, you know, and he says, I am a part of all that I have met. Uh, and, and, when, and, and what is the, you know, Tennyson's theme in Ulysses is very clear, uh, as sell on, sell on, sell on and on. I mean, keep reaching out, keep looking. Uh, and so uh, 
you know, I'm really only uh, just a mixture of a lot of wonderful people who have uh, uh, been part of my, uh, I've, been, I've had the luck to interact with. Thank you.